Get to it. Okay, uh, good afternoon. And welcome for uh, joining us for another series of the um, Jane, Epi uh, Jane Irrigation Training Series. I'm Richard Rastusha, Vice President of Water Management Solutions. And uh, today we're gonna be talking about uh, something that I think is really um, fascinating. It's a little basic, but it's something that is, uh, it's a basic concept that sometimes we have trouble understanding. Right, because there's two things that we really talk about when it comes to plants and water, and uh, and those two things are how long to water and then how frequently to water. So really break it down into two simple areas: how long do you leave your water on, and how often should you be turning that water on. So today we're really going to focus on uh, that part of that equation that is how long to leave your water on. Right, And how long you leave the water running or how long you irrigate is really based a lot on your landscape characteristics. Or if you're a grower, you know, your farm characteristics. And by characteristics, we mean things like soil, slope, shade, sun. These all impact it. So taking us on this journey of uh, learning really how long to run our irrigation is uh, Danny Martinez. Uh, so Danny's been uh, very helpful in these webinars before. Uh, Danny really has a great concept and great understanding of irrigation concepts. More importantly, he's really good at transferring those concepts into easy to understand instructions for all of us to get. And that's why I always enjoy Danny's uh, input. Danny's done a lot of irrigation training over the years. He's based in Southern California. He's been working in this industry really all his life. He really understands water, water management. He understands the challenges that contractors go through in managing water. And uh, man, if you've got a question or a challenge about irrigation, uh, or if I do, Danny's going to be my first call. He really gets it. So Danny, welcome. Thanks for uh, joining us today. Thanks for having Richard. Yeah, uh, landscape characteristics here, uh, real important. Something to uh, come across a lot uh, doing the trainings and and for uh, AT water controllers on the Unity platform. Yeah, so Danny, with the, uh, I mean, we're in the serious drought, as you said earlier, uh, when we were talking, you said we've had like three days of winter. Uh, you know, we're gonna be irrigating in February. Uh, we didn't have much rain in January. I don't see any rain in the forecast in the next two to three weeks. Um, uh, are, are your contractor customers starting to worry about the drought? Yeah, definitely. Uh, a lot of conversation going on uh, about new uh, water restrictions that will most likely be implemented um, this year again, and uh, the limitations that come with that. You know, maintain a, a beautiful green, lush landscape uh, without uh, stressing the plant material and keeping within the water budget. Yeah. So now with this drought, with that situation for contractors uh, and their customers. Uh, it's going to be more important to really focus on water this year. We're already seeing it with the amount of uh, inquiries coming in uh, and, uh, and uh, questions and uh, people wanting solutions to this. Uh, how important is uh, your landscape characteristics to managing your water? Uh, very important. Yeah, there's so many variables that uh, affect how often and the amount of water that we can put down. And uh, they all play a, a significant role. Um, and we can just touch right into that. Um, on the schedule adjustments, right? So this is a pretty simple uh, little diagram here, uh, both showing the same plant materials, just a couple of different graphs. Um, the one on the left here, uh, the blue bars showing when we're watering. As you can see, the frequency or the days in between watering change based on our ET as the ET rises, you know, right? We're getting warmer, hotter days, or like today, uh, down in Southern California, kind of windy, drying things out. Uh, higher the ET, the more frequently we need to put that water down. Even though we're putting down the same amount of water, we're limited to that to that soil capacity and that plant material. Uh, we're going to change the frequency on how often we water. Yeah, so I think that's a, a really um, important and simple concept that a lot of people don't get. Right? They think, hey, it's summertime. It's uh, 90 degrees, so I have to put more water on my plants. 
Um, why, why isn't that right? Why shouldn't we just keep watering our plants when it's hot and, uh, and not give them so much water when it's cool? Well, we don't want to overwater, right? Because our plants have what we call a root depth. Uh, for turf, for example, we usually have four to six inches of root depth. If we're putting down a ton of water down there, uh, we could be wasting water because that water is getting uh, pushed down below the root zone uh, where the plants can't access it. I see. So if we if we fill up the root zone and then the uh, plant takes up a certain amount of water, then maybe we have to water the next day or maybe we water in two days because we're increasing the frequency. But if we just pour on a bunch of water at one time, it pushes down past the root zone. Correct. Not only push down, uh, we may be causing a situation where we're causing runoff and it's just going down to storm drains. Again, wasting water. Yeah. So um, tell us a little bit about then this uh, chart on the right hand side, the one that has the green columns and some green and blue and that line that goes across the, uh, the middle. Yeah. So this is our, our water bucket broken down daily. Um, you can see the amount of water available for our plants in the soil. Um, this orange line across being our trigger level. Once we hit that level, we want to go ahead and recharge the root zone, refill it with water. Um, up to the blue line, our blue line being our soil capacity, right? We don't want to exceed that because then we're running uh, the chance of having water runoff, uh, puddling uh, in some areas or watering deeper than the roots are. Yeah, so the other way I like to look at this sometimes, Danny, tell me if this is correct or not, but uh, you know, uh, if, I'm, uh, if I'm getting hungry all the time, right? And uh, I'm, I let myself be hungry for a long period of time. I'm going to be cranky. I'm going to be irritable. I'm, you're not going to get as much work out of me or production. Whereas if I had somebody just feeding me every time I started to get a little hungry and I could stay pretty consistent, you can get a lot more production out of me. Can, can we apply that to plants as well? Absolutely. Great, great analogy there, Richard. Yeah, we want to keep those plants happy uh, in the zone there and uh, make sure they have the available water. Not too much, not too little. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, gosh, what a what a nice tool that you have here for showing exactly where the water moisture is in the soil when it needs water and when it doesn't. So, okay, so all right, I think I have this. I think I understand that it's the same amount of time we want to water every time. It just changes on the frequency. But again, how do we figure out how much time we want to water every time? Yeah. And, and I, I just want to mention too, right? Now, new plantings, uh, you know, a one-year-old tree versus a 10-year, there are some exceptions, of course. And I just want to recognize that, but, you know, in most cases. Yeah, correct. Mo in most cases, uh, this is going to be termed by our landscape characteristics, right? The plant material being one of the biggest factors, um, how often and how long will it be determined by kind of our soil type, uh, the sprinkler, or the water application method. Okay, so I think you have a slide on this, correct? Yeah, absolutely. So here's our landscape characteristics, and this is what the information we're going to give our smart controller, so it knows what's out in the field, what it's watering, when to water, how it's being watered. Uh, first one, irrigation method, real important. How we're putting we're putting that water out there, whether it be a sprinkler, a drip system, uh, maybe a bubbler. Uh, they all change the amount how fast we can put that water down. And of course, the plant type. The plant is going to determine how drought tolerant it is, uh, how frequent we need to water because of different uh, root depths. Our precipitation rate and our flow rate was going to be determined by, by our irrigation method, but uh, we need to know that uh, along with the distribution of uniformity. So we know how we uh, frequently um, we need to maybe cycle the watering, maybe on off, do a couple of small short waterings throughout the day uh, or through our water window instead of just one long watering. Root depth is going to help us uh, determine how far down we need to water. Right? We can calculate how fast we're putting it down. We can calculate how uh, it's going to percolate the soil and how long much time we need to water to get down to the bottom of that root depth. And again, our slope. Slope and soil type, real big kick factors to determine also how fast we can put that water down. And shade factor, how fast it's going to evaporate, it's going to affect that a little bit also. So then you're going to take us through each one of these and kind of explain uh, how, what the impact is. Yeah, absolutely. We're, we'll touch on uh, on these here uh, and see identify a couple of uh, things to look out while you're out there in the field inspecting the site and uh, understanding how it affects your watering schedule. 
for example, here, our irrigation method uh, on the left, see we have a sprinkler spray head pop-up uh, pretty commonly used in turf for planters. Um, so one of the misconceptions is, hey, I see a sprinkler like this type here, I have a spray head. Uh, but the nozzle on these can be different. As you can see by the three different uh, nozzles on the right there, your spray pattern, the first one there, uh, typically used in a, in a turf or a shrub application, maybe in ground cover also, uh, but puts out water a little uh, faster than the other two methods. Um, and then your MP rotator, uh, really nice sprinkler system, um, puts out the water a lot slower than a spray head would, uh, but can be used in a similar application. And then lastly, a stream nozzle. As you can see from this, if you were just looking at the top from that first spray head to that stream nozzle, uh, when that's down, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Uh, but a stream nozzle is typically going to be a slower application rate and maybe not quite as far of a distance as a spray head. Well, then, having it lower. Yeah, so if I understand correctly, the key here is just because you have you see a spray in the ground, the spray is actually the spray body, the pop-up. Correct. What really matters is the nozzle that's on top of it because the nozzles put out different amounts of water. So if you're just thinking I have a spray head, you may be completely wrong if you're thinking you have a spray head with a regular spray nozzle. Absolutely, Richard. And uh, here we can see some, some of the differences. Um, the biggest, one of the biggest one is uh, gallons per minute. How much water are we using? So if we're gonna calculate the gallons per minute versus our runtime, uh, if it can be a huge change where maybe you're drastically underwatering or you're overwatering quite a bit, just based on the gallons per minute and the precip rate. Um, for example, here our spray head, uh, usually for a turf, a small five foot nozzle, these could go up to 15, 18 feet. Um, usually we're going from 0 0.09 gallons per minute to almost three gallons per minute. So they can put out the water out pretty fast, especially if you have a high distribution uniformity, which we'll cover next. Um, yeah, and this is just, uh, this is always shocking to me when I see, uh, two, almost three gallons per minute <laughs> coming out of these spray heads. Uh, and if I think of eight uh, spray heads on a zone, you know, maybe 24 to 32 gallons a minute coming out, uh, it's, uh, that's incredible. Uh, I think about what, what amount of soil could actually, uh, you know, what, what soil type could actually take that much water and how much gets misted away in the, uh, in, in the wind and ends up in places uh, I don't want it. Absolutely, absolutely. And one of the key things to touch on there is wind. Uh, something like the center nozzle, that MP rotator has a sharp stream. Uh, it's a lot better for cutting, piercing through those uh, windy areas. Um, you can see the water consumption could be up to double as the spray head nozzle, but this sprinkler could cover a much larger area uh, where your spray head can go maybe up to 15, 18 feet. Your MP rotator can cover up to 40 feet radius. So when you consider uh, the square footage there, it could be four times as much. Yeah. I, I don't want to take us down a complete rabbit hole on yeah. this, but sometimes <laughs> it really bugs me. Yeah. Um, so distribution uniformity, right? This is how well a device and emitter uh, waters, right? Um, distribution uniformity on maybe a spray head system. You see a lot of these, right? You're out there all the time. What, uh, What's typical for distribution uniformity on a, on a, on a turf uh, with a regular spray head and a spray nozzle? The regular spray head on the top one here that we first here we see, um, usually we're right about 50%. You know, uh, there's many variables, the, the sprinkler uh, spacing, um, correct nozzle, maybe it's been changed throughout the years um, by the technicians out in the field. Uh, you got wind blowing away some of it. So Danny, just to, 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 to drive this home, if, uh, if my front yard needs a thousand gallons of water today, because uh, it's, it's the frequency is correct and today's the watering day, but my distribution uniformity is at 50%, I'm really gonna have to put on 2000 gallons uh, to get my 1000 because, uh, because of the distribution uniformity being so low with spray hits. Correct, correct. And then uh, things like drip irrigation, do they have a higher distribution uniformity? Uh, again, there's many variables there, right? Uh, if a drip irrigation, that's, you got point source or subsurface irrigation, but yeah, a uh, higher uniformity generally than the spray head. You're not getting uh, uh, quite as much uh, evaporation or the, the wind blow off. Yeah, and I know things like, uh, you know, in the agricultural industry, 
you know, they put in a lot of drip because a lot of times if they're applying for loans on irrigation and they, they need a 0.9 distribution uniformity or higher, which uh, we really only achieve in drip irrigation. So uh, uh, yeah, uh, what a difference, right? What a savings in just moving from sprays to drip. Absolutely, I think that the highest I've seen on a, on a spray irrigation used about 0.7, uh, maybe a, a 0.85 at best. Yeah, okay, well, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, the big thing here is our piece of rate. Uh, I'll just cover the first two here. On a spray head, usually about 1.5 inches per hour. That's how fast that water's getting put down on the soil. Uh, where MP rotor, uh, usually about a 0 0.4, 0 0.8 on a smaller uh, model there. Um, but if you just do the quick math, uh, the water goes down about a third as fat, a third of the rate on an MP rotor as it does on a spray head. So uh, if you were to transfer that to minutes on irrigation, your MP rotor is going to need a water three times as long uh, as the general rule. Yeah, I think that throws a lot of people off too because they think I'm putting on a water conserving device. So if I was running my spray head with a spray nozzle, 20 minutes, I'm going to run this less. But actually, if you were running it 20 minutes, you might be running it closer to 60 minutes with a, a rotating nozzle. Yeah, absolutely. And here, here's a, a automatic schedule that that demonstrates that uh, the top uh, window here uh, first station here same uh same uh landscape profile soil slope uh all that's the same only thing we're changing is this, that spray nozzle right so top one being a spray the bottom one being you know, one of those mp rotators and we can see here all the way on the right we're putting down the same amount of water a spray head only needs 13 minutes of watering to do what that mp rotor does in 45 minutes yeah okay. So then, so then here's the key, right? And I, I don't want to confuse myself, but I said, you got to write water the same frequency every time, but the amount uh, the same time uh, every watering, but in this case, because of the different watering devices, the amount of time varies. Correct. We got two different uh, uh, precipitation rates here. If we were to calculate the, the amount of water going down, it'd be equivalent on both of these. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's helpful. Very helpful. Thank you. And so one of the things come, that come across quite often on trainings is uh, kind of a, what we're trying to focus on here, making sure your landscape profile, your characteristics are correct in a smart controller programming. Uh, here we got the two same stations. Uh, and then what we did here is notice we increased the water budget 150% on the spray head. Uh, oftentimes, customer or landscapers, contractors, or homeowners will replace their sprinkler nozzle, right? Let's get something more efficient, like an MP rotator in there. And then they notice, hey, my lawn's starting to dry out. What's going on here? Let me increase the, the runtime minutes. And they go to 150%, which is a maximum here. And it's still only giving me 20 minutes of watering. I need to double that more, you know? And this is something we're simple. We're identifying the right application method is, is critical, where maybe the the user didn't go back in there when they retrofitted to a new nozzle, didn't change that in the system. System doesn't know that a change was made. So Danny, where do I find like this information of what the precip rate is or the gallons per minute, right? Okay, I know I've got an MP rotator, but now I wanna know the precip rate or the gallons per minute, where, where would I find that? Uh, so normally when you purchase a, a new nozzle, uh, they should have some uh, data uh, on there that tells you the precipitation rate or you can go onto a manufacturer website to identify that, or sometimes uh, when you get a sprinkler with the nozzle already installed, it gives you the information also. Yeah, and I, I got to tell you, I oftentimes see, right, I go onto a site and I'll see uh, uh, a, a Rainbird uh, spray head and Rainbird nozzle, and then a Toro, and then a Hunter. You know, multiple manufacturers and spray heads on one site. Can, can you do that? Does that work? Uh, it's it. So if you stick spray head to spray head, you're going to be close. You know, ideally you'd, you'd like to stick to the same manufacturer uh, but to what they call uh, match precipitation rate within their their sprinkler heads. Uh, which is especially what you definitely don't want to do is is mix like a spray head with MP rotors on the same stations. Yeah, you'll never get the right amount of water, and you'll always right. be overwatering because you'll be watering to the uh, the the lowest amount of uh, uh, water being put out. Exactly. 
Uh, so here's a couple uh, uh, demonstrations here of, of what to look for when you're out there, uh, the effective precipitation rate and your distribution uniformity. The two here on the left, the top one, this is a, a rotor. So we're all familiar with the sprinkler that just rotates back and forth. Uh, you usually cover a large area, 30, 50, 70 foot radius. Uh, top one here, you got a nice sharp stream, uh, what they call a rain curtain effect is getting nice even watering. Uh, this is what you wanna see when you're out there doing your site walks, a, a nice sharp stream. And then on the bottom, you see the same type of sprinkler really blasting the water out there, causing a lot of mist. We know that mist is gonna get blown away, all it takes is a gentle breeze. And as well, uh, you don't see that crisp uh, spray pattern. So a lot of times customer contractors or, or users, not knowingly, will put in a bigger nozzle because they maybe to see, I have, hey, I got a dry spot here. I need a bigger nozzle that puts more water out, but it doesn't cover evenly. So instead of uh, putting the proper nozzle and maybe increasing the runtime, they'll just uh, throw a bigger nozzle out there to try to get the same effect. But uh, as a side effect, wasting a little extra water there. Bottle water, so yeah, <laughs> yeah a little bit. We'll consider one sprinkler a lot. We can consider a large zone. You see here in this picture, you can see four large rivers just blasting a lot of water out there. Uh, top one uh, on the right here, normal spray pattern on a spray nozzle. This is what you want to see: nice uniform, big water droplets, as you can see here. Avoid clogged nozzles. Here on the right, uh, very common. Usually, this is caused by sprinklers being too low, and it's not. Uh, from debris coming through the line because they normally have a filter to capture that stuff. But because the sprinkler's too low, when the system gets shut off, it, suction is causing the system and it pulls debris in from the outside of the nozzle. So that sprinkler there uh, needs to be flushed out and possibly raise that sprinkler head. And the one just below here, a lot of misting here. That's not what we want to see on a spray head system. Uh, that's mess, uh, gonna mess up your precip rate and waste a lot of water. And yeah, and uh, you may or may not be helping out your neighbor. If your driveway is right next to that, you're, uh, you're, you're hurting, hurting your neighbor. And if their lawn's right there, you're actually giving your neighbor a lot of, lot of water, right? Yeah, give them a lot of water. And if it's next to the, their driveway, you're probably wetting their cars and not too happy with you either. <laughs> yeah. So I would think with the thatch and buildup and turf buildup uh, naturally that uh, raising spray heads would have to be something you would, you, you should do s somewhat regularly, you know, uh, every every few years, right? I, I think you would always have to be raising your spray heads. Correct. Yeah, part of regular maintenance, uh, uh, the thatching, something that a lot of people don't do regularly, um, that would help reduce uh, the amount of sprinkler maintenance, uh, raising or lowering them. Uh, but yeah, uh, something that should definitely be checked out regularly. And so here's a quick, simple diagram to explain our distribution for me. How even is that water getting put out to that lawn? Um, Simple test is do a, a water rider or cast can test, put out these little cones on your lawn, see how evenly they get filled up uh, to determine what your distribution uniformity is. And it's a simple calculation to do that. Um, but this diagram on the right really makes it simple to understand. We got two sprinklers, uh, one on each side, and you see the space is a little further apart. And you can see these little water cans. The ones close to the sprinkler, they get quite a bit of water. As they go further out towards the center, it's less and less, right? So not very even watering across the board there. Move the sprinklers in a little bit more. And you can see our, our catch cans getting filled up a little more evenly, you know? Our, our distribution is going up a little higher. And then ideally, we want that head-to-head -head coverage. And you can see across the board, all the catch cans are nice and even. You're not gonna get any dry spots. That's what we call a head-to-head -head coverage. Uh, gonna give you a high distribution uh, uniformity. Uh, and even then, we're still maybe at best 70% on, on a spray head irrigation system. Yeah, you know, that's uh, that's a good concept to talk about, too, the head-to-head. -head. I know uh, uh, it's uh, pretty natural for, you know, everybody in the irrigation industry, but uh, a lot of people, when they first uh, come into it, or homeowners, you know, don't, don't get that. And uh, the importance of um, uh, being sure you uh, project the water all the way to the other head. Absolutely. And sometimes uh, it could be poor maintenance, Richard. Sometimes uh, you got people come in and, and they say, hey, I need a little more water. Uh, it's not reaching quite far. So they add a bigger nozzle, right? They change your nozzle from maybe a 10 foot spray to a 15 foot spray. Next thing you know, they're doing the same thing for five or six of the nozzles. Now they change the hydraulics and those sprinklers don't have enough water pressure, volume of water to spray that necessary distance. So the ones that we're doing 10 foot, 
are now going eight foot, seven foot, and they're not covering the same area that they initially tended to do. Yeah, and the other thing you mentioned earlier that, that I find more often than not is it's a, uh, it's a dirty nozzle, right? And if I just take a bucket of water and go out and take off all the nozzles, rinse them in the water in the bucket, put the nozzle back on, uh, more often than not, I uh, increase my distribution uniformity and I start to get better head-to-head -head coverage when I do that. Correct. Yeah, you want to make sure those nozzles are, are spraying, spraying nice and evenly and how they're intended to. Uh, next big factor here is our soil, right? So our soil has a huge impact on how, how long we can water and how frequently we water. Uh, different soil types uh, hold the water differently. For example, our sandy soil, um, if you're unfamiliar on how to test for soil, or sandy soil, if you take like a golf ball size into your hand and it's a little moist, squeeze it together, when you let go, it's going to fall apart quite easily on its own. Move your hand a little, uh, it's going to separate back into individual sand particles. Um, benefit of sand is it does have a high precip rate. It can absorb the water faster, so you can get less runoff. Um, but it can't retain that water very well or as long as the other two soil types. Uh, so one of the concept, uh, misconceptions there is, oh, let me just throw a lot of water out there. Uh, on the contrary, when you're watering a sandy soil, say you, for instance, you want to, you need to water 20 minutes to get the necessary amount of water. Uh, on a sandy soil, you're going to want to break that into multiple cycles, let it rest or a cycle or a soak uh, time is what we call it. Um, maybe put five minutes down and do four minute cycles with a 30, 40 minute break in between. Uh, your loam soil, uh, kind of you're in the middle, right? You got a mixture of clay, uh, sandy uh, material in there. Uh, if you were to test for loam soil, you take, again, a golf ball size. It's a little moist. You hold it together in your hand. If you, once you open up your hand, it stays together pretty well. You know, you kind of have to uh, crush it a little bit to get it to separate back up. Uh, pretty good decent precipitation rate, right? It can take the water pretty well. Maybe a few cycles, but it holds the water pretty good. Um, and it's going to give you a normal watering frequency on that. Lastly, we have our clay soil, right? We're going to test for clay, put it in a ball, stays there, kind of like a putty or dough, right? It sticks together if it's a little wet. Uh, if you smash it down, it still kind of keeps some of its form. Um, downside of clay soil, low precipitation rate. We have to put the water out there a lot slower. So uh, like an MP rotor versus a spray, it will be ideal for clay because it puts the water out a lot slower. Uh, downside, more runoff to clay, especially if you have a, a long water cycle. Um, but benefit is it holds on to that water a long time, right? Less frequently will you have to water. Yeah, so these, this is great. So if I understand you correctly, so with, uh, and, and this is where it matters, if we ran water for five minutes with sandy soil or five minutes with loam, there's a higher probability that sandy soil water is gonna push past the root zone and we'll be wasting water and we'll be wasting any nutrients that in that water versus um, uh, the loam. So as a result, we're gonna shorten up the amount, of, we're gonna take the time and divide it into uh, different uh, uh, zones or, or cycles. And we're gonna, if we've got five minutes of water, we might go two and a half minutes twice with Sandy. And conversely with the, uh, with the clay soil, it's the same way. Because if you're putting on too much water, you're gonna get the runoff because the water's just not gonna penetrate that soil very fast. Correct, yes, uh, clay soil exactly the same. You gotta put out a little bit, let it soak in and then give it that soak time before you apply more water. Yeah, okay. And so here's the uh, exact same station profiles here. I demonstrated on a weekly schedule. Uh, your sprinkler plant type is all the same. Only difference is the soil type. Uh, top one here being the loam. Uh, this was just done yesterday to, for demonstration. We see here, it will need water based on current uh, ET. Uh, won't need water till Friday, but we can do just one 13 minute cycle. Our clay soil is gonna hold that water a little longer. So we're gonna be able to go a couple days further out. Sorry guys. It's gonna go a couple extra days without watering, but we're gonna need to cycle it, two nine minute cycles. So he's thinking, hey, maybe it's a little more water. So actually, if we, if we were to run this out to the next watering event, they'll average out the total amount of water going down. Um, but the frequency and the amount of water, how fast or how much we can put down one time uh, does very little. And then we look at our... But ahead, because Richard. it's clay soil, it holds water better than sandy. 
then it, we're going to water less frequently because it's holding the water. And when we do water, we're going to break it up into two uh, different watering times because we don't want the runoff. Correct. So this turf loam soil, uh, maybe, maybe three, four days in between watering, or our clay soil might be five, six, seven days in between watering. So less frequent watering. And then our sandy soil, you see here, it doesn't hold the moisture quite as well. So we're going to break up that watering into three different days. Can't hold as long, so we got to water more frequently and less runtime per. Wow. So, I mean, the type of soil you have is uh, really important to your watering and knowing that. Now, uh, I always tell people you should get a soil sample and really understand what's in your soil nutrients and what type of soil you have. Lots of people don't, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's an added expense and time. Are there easier ways to determine what your soil type is? Uh, yeah, uh, so one, if you're looking at our ET water controller and, and doing your program, we have a nice help menu to help you determine. Um, there's simple uh, jar method where you fill up uh, a jar with some water in some of your soil um, to determine, let it settle, determine what kind of soil you have. But yeah, very simple uh, methods out there. Yeah, I know too, if I just take the soil, ball it up in my hands, uh, if it sticks together really hard and solid when I do that, and doesn't come apart. I know I have clay and then depending on how easy it breaks up or how hard it is to get it to clump, um, in the most simplest terms, I know how uh, sandy or loamy it is as a result. Yeah, absolutely. So now we got to, we have two factors, right? So far we, we've covered kind of a, the, the application method, our soil type. Now maybe we're also dealing with the slope, right? So here we got three different levels of information, a flat, a medium, and a steep slope. This being shrub zones, uh, that slope may affect your cycles also. So this here, these are all loan cycles, all identical. All we did was change a, a slope factor on it. Nice flat slope, you know, water, 15 minutes, two cycles, giving us 30 minutes of water on a flat slope. A medium cycle, pretty similar, 15 minutes, two times. Uh, depending on the irrigation, if you have something that puts water a lot faster than a spray head, you'll probably see more cycles on a, on a medium slope than a, than a flat. Uh, but then you can see here on the steep cycle, steep slope, I'm sorry, we're going 10 minute cycles three times. We're breaking up an extra uh, watering cycle. We're all getting 30 minutes of watering, but we have to do multiple cycles to prevent that runoff. And that's once again, because of the st steepness of the slope, that water is just going to push lower. That's why a lot of times when I look at a slope, I see the plants at the bottom thriving and the plants at the top a little dry. Correct. You gave that runoff. Those bottom plants looking nice and healthy. Yeah. So here, next thing we're going to cover a little bit is our plant type. So plant type, one of the biggest factors, uh, kind of determines how deep our roots depth is. Uh, I labeled them here, for example. Uh, so first one here being shrubs. Shrubs a little more drought tolerant, uh, can go more days without watering. They got a deeper roots than say your, your lawn, station two here. So for example here, this plant won't need water till Saturday. This, although we're seeing one time a week, this is gonna go six, seven days between watering here uh, for a shrub with a nine root, root depth. Uh, this probably won't water from Saturday, won't water again till next Wednesday or Thursday. Where this lawn, four inch root zone, it's watering 13 minutes. One, we got, a fraction of the watering tank was only going four inches deep, but this might water uh, Tuesday, Wednesday of next week. So a little more frequent than your shrubs. And then succulent trees with larger root depths, they obviously the succulents uh, much more drought tolerant. They don't show they need any water for this week. These plants might need two water for two, three weeks right now in the winter. And ground cover pretty close to our nine inch root depth with the eight inch root depth as our shrubs. That's gonna go an extra day without watering, but a little more water. Danny, how in the world do I know how deep my root depth is? So a couple of ways you can do it. One is if you got a new plant, right? Usually they have a little plant label that tells you how deep that, that plant's gonna grow uh, once it's fully established. Uh, two, um, identify the plant, you know, Google, great resource there. Look up the plant type, get the information from that or a couple other ones. One I like is getting the soil probe. Get out there, dig down your actual plants and determine how far those roots are going. 
And the other thing now I see now is there's apps out there that'll do it for you. You just point your camera on your smartphone at the plan. It'll tell you what kind of plan it is and all the information you need about them. That's great. Those are good tips. And uh, boy, uh, very, very helpful, right? To uh, Because this root depth is really root depth and what type of soil you have are, are super key in figuring out how long to water. Absolutely. Um, so here's for comparison. Um, we, we know how frequently we need to water now, the different plant types. Um, but what if we have different plant types with different application methods? Uh, so here side by side is the same plant material, same soil, same slope. Only thing we're changing is the application method, right? This first line is all shrub spray heads, uh, different plant material, I'm sorry, but spray heads and the right being different application methods. If we can see for comp comparison, this shrubs on sprays needs a 30 minute runtime. Where if we just switch over to a bubbler system with one gallon per minute, we only need one minute to water that plant, right? So putting that water down a lot faster. Uh, similar to, uh, we'll cover uh, ground cover here also. Ground cover is pretty close on a spray head versus subsurface, 43 minutes. But look at your trees, a tree system, nine, nine minute cycles to go down 24 inches. It's gonna take about 81 minutes to get that water down. You got the tree bubblers, only about a minute. Uh, this is uh, using one gallon per millimeter super tree. Yeah, it's really, so... <laughs> Now, now you've added the third variable, right? The soil right. type, the plant, and then how you're putting on the water all contributes. And boy, these uh, really show how dramatically the uh, application method can change how much water your plant's getting. Correct, absolutely. And then it'll all affect how long you can water them, your water windows, um, how frequently you're, you're going to water. A lot of variables, and that's only covering three or four so far. And we have not compounded all of them into one single station. <laughs> so when do we want to look at these uh, landscape profiles to determine if they're accurate? Um, and it, and it's, it could be uh, for many reasons. Um, one is changes are made to the landscape. Uh, for example, out here in Southern California, we had a, a big push a few years ago to pull out the turf and retrofit to, to drought tolerant succulent plants, uh, more drought tolerant uh, natives. Um, so if you change your plant material, you definitely want to go back in there and reprogram your controller to the right plant material. Uh, usually when that's done, a uh, new plant material, also they're going to change the irrigation method, maybe going from an overhead spray head and switching to a subsurface uh, irrigation like a Jane Total CV or, um, or like a point source emitter. So definitely want to reprogram controller anytime any changes are made to your landscape. Also, when you have a new contractor come on board, uh, Unfortunately, the, the truth out there is that sometimes contractors like to make a little more life a little more difficult for a new contractor taking over a site, and they might make some changes to, to make their difficult to make their life more difficult. You want to go in when you inherit a new site, go in there and review your profiles, make things are, make sure things are accurate. That way, you don't go through a phase where you're overwatering and then you're, you're you're seeing high water bales or plants being stressed out, then you're trying to catch up on your watering. Yeah, really helpful, right? Uh, these uh, visual checks, whether you do them weekly or monthly, are so helpful to, uh, uh, or annually, so helpful to getting this, uh, this formula correct. Correct. Uh, and then lastly, uh, maybe you have issues with the watering schedule. You got too much water, right? Maybe you're seeing water puddling or it's always extremely wet. You got muddy soil going around or maybe not enough water. Your plants are being, are being stressed out and you, you've made those adjustments to, to the parameters, limits in your control programming, it's time to review your landscape characteristics. So here they are again, uh, irrigation method, plant type, precip rate, flow rate, distribution conformity, root depth, slope, soil type, shade, all things you wanna take in consideration and review on your landscape profiles. Wow, that was a lot, Danny, uh, and I really appreciate it. I always love it when you come on the show because you uh, definitely, I, I learned something from you every time and uh, it, it's kind of fascinating. I, I hope that you'll come back maybe in a few months and we'll talk about how frequently to water then, right? We know how long to water. We at least know how to figure that out now, but uh, frequency then becomes the other part of that formula. And uh, uh, that would be fun to learn as well. Absolutely, love to be back anytime. Thank you, Richard. <laughs>
Yeah. So if people have questions, comments, uh, want to follow up, uh, how, how do they uh, get a hold of you? But what's the best way? Uh, here's my email. You can reach out direct, uh, dmartinez at Jane's USA. Or uh, if you have another uh, contact within Jane, they could uh, gladly uh, connect you with me. Okay. Well, that's great, Danny. A great offer to, to uh, allow people to reach out to you with questions about their irrigation. Uh, take advantage of it because Danny is one of the best in the business. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. I uh, really appreciate your time uh, spending this with us. We know how valuable your time is, and hopefully we're delivering uh, some good quality irrigation education. Uh, all our trainings you can find on janesusa.com forward slash trainings. We're also wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And it's really cool to me to see how many people are listening to our podcast. I know they're out there working or driving to jobs and they're educating themselves at the same time, bettering the industry, helping to conserve more water. Uh, this is what gets me excited and up every day. So thank you for doing that. Thanks again, Danny. And uh, we'll see you guys all back here on Friday. Uh, Michael Derwenko is going to be here on Friday and he's going to be talking about how to, how to photograph sports fields uh, better, right? We all know how to take a picture of a sports field, but he's going to really help us focus on how to do it better so you get really good, sharp images. And I'm going to bet a lot of those images have irrigation going off at the same time. So that's always cool. All right. Thanks again, Danny. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you guys uh, Friday. All right. Bye now.